There are many heartbreaking stories that we can share with you on the International Day of the Disappeared. Take, for example, Rania Al-Abbasi. She was forcibly disappeared by the Syrian regime in 2013 together with her husband and six children. The youngest was two years old. We need a political subject that will be uh, left-wing and pro-working class. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to the struggle. We begin with some routine matters in Palestine. First, children separated from their parents because of an apartheid state law forbidding some Palestinians from living with their wives. Several years ago, the Israeli government passed a law forbidding Palestinian citizens of Israel who marry Palestinians from the West Bank from having their spouse come to 48 Palestine to live. It's still the law. Now something else, routine confiscation of Palestinian property, this in Masafer, Yatta. A technician was servicing solar panels at the same time that someone from the only democracy in the Middle East was confiscating those solar panels. The Israeli government ended its investigation of the killing of Shireen Abu Akha by concluding that no one should be punished in any way. Israeli journalist Amira Haas in Haaretz savaged the investigation's findings, calling the investigation a cover-up. For details about that, see the website Justice for Shireen. On the other hand, Ned Price, U.S. State Department spokesperson, said, We welcome Israel's review of this tragic incident and again underscore the importance of accountability in this case, such as policies and procedures to prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. Let me translate Ned Price's statement for you into English. We want to thank the Israeli government for its whitewash investigation and understand that no one will be punished and that you'll come up with some phony procedure for the future so we can all pretend that we're doing something. The International Day of the Disappeared took place on August 30th. Omar Alshagar who was a former prisoner of the Assad regime and who was tortured in its prisons, and now who works for the Syrian Emergency Task Force, gave illustrations. 
There are many heartbreaking stories that we can share with you on the International Day of the Disappeared. Take, for example, Rania Abbasi. She was forcibly disappeared by the Syrian regime in 2013 together with her husband and six children. The youngest was two years old. That two years old is now 11 years old. If a life doesn't know the difference between sweet and salty, never seen the sun or the moon, never went to school and had the chance to have friends in dark cell, hearing the torture of their friends, neighbors, and families. That's the reality. And the regime is doing far more than just that. That's why you and I must tell their stories to be able to reach the world and put pressure, any possible pressure, to enforce justice and accountability to hold the same regime accountable for their crimes against the humanity. More of our coverage about nuclear power issues centering on Diablo Canyon in California. Harvey Wasserman, a longtime anti-nuclear campaigner, spoke the day before the California legislature agreed to give five more years to the aged plant. Just for those of you interested, I will be on KGO at 1 p.m. with Pat Thurston today as soon as this conference is over, if you want to listen in and call. And I'm a Los Angeles resident. I have children and grandchildren uh, in Los Angeles. I've been with the nuclear issue since the 70s. Back then, you had to have an evacuation plan <clears throat> to have a license. And uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, of course, I'll let this go. But I would like to see the evacuation plan for Los Angeles. Um, um, if there is, God forbid, a major accident, uh, uh, there, someone is screen sharing here, Marta Stern. Um, if there, if God, God forbid, there's an accident uh, at Diablo Canyon, and you know we've been going here for all these years for the grace of God. The only reason that the Diablo Canyon hasn't turned into an apocalypse is that uh, uh, we haven't had an earthquake. God knows we're overdue. Dr. Michael Peck, the new NRC site inspector long, long ago said that those two reactors cannot um, uh, withstand credible earthquakes. And basically we're playing Fukushima roulette here. It's outrageous. So let the governor show us the evacuation plan for Los Angeles, please, before there's anything uh, uh, um, goes further. I will say about the process, that, um, Gavin Newsom was party to the, um, uh, to the the agreement to shut Diablo in 2016. He's been rolling along in 2019. We specifically asked him with a petition signed by 2,500 people, uh, including Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Martin Sheen, uh, Eric Roberts, uh, uh, Ed Asner. Uh, we asked him to please inspect Unit 1 because we know it's embrittled, but we don't know how embrittled it is and whether pipes are breaking and so on. And Gavin Newsom in 2019 refused to inspect uh, either reactor. How do you continue operating 50 year old, 40 year old machines if they're not inspected? Our cars in California have to be inspected and they also have to be insured. Diablo Canyon has no insurance. There is a $13 billion fund or thereabouts with, which will cover the damage maybe to half of Avila Beach and the trillions of dollars in damage that will be done by Diablo Canyon if and when it blows up, for God's sakes, have no insurance. I have a home in Los Angeles. I've read the insurance policy. There is a specific exemption. If Diablo Canyon blows up, God forbid, and a radioactive cloud covers my house in the valley, I get nothing. Nobody gets anything. There is no insurance. It's outrageous. It's even more outrageous now that they've thrown in a bill to kill solar. What sane energy planner in 2022 kills rooftop solar in California while arguing that we need the power from a nuclear power plant? That is the definition of bad faith and of insanity. And we are all at risk from here. We're all uninsured. And, um, uh, you know, we got to stop playing Fukushima roulette. I will end by saying in 1977, I marched in Japan uh, with thousands of Japanese citizens who specifically said, do not build nuclear power plants 
in a zone washed by tsunamis and shaken by earthquakes. And TEPCO and the Japanese government laughed at us and said, forget it, it's not going to happen. We know it happened. We have been warning exactly the same thing at Diablo Canyon for 50 years. And these people, not only don't these people listen, but they have no morals and no ethics in pushing through this extension and we have to stop it. I'll shoot through some credentials real quick. I have a bachelor's and master's in nuclear reactor operator, was a senior vice president in the nuclear industry, I have a safety, nuclear safety patent and uh, um, three peer reviewed journal articles as well as God knows how many times I've testified in front of uh, uh, different regulatory uh, agencies about the um, about nuclear safety. Um, uh, you can tell I'm an old guy. I'm 74, 73 years old. Diablo Canyon's design began when I was in 10th grade. They were designing this plant in 1965. And in 1967, they began to build a nuclear reactor. And when they welded the nuclear reactor together, they used the wrong metal. Uh, the metal causes embrittlement, which I'll get into in a minute. But they recognized in 1972 that they had the wrong metal in. And it was 15 years later when the unit started up. Yet they continued um, with, the, with the nuclear reactor that had the wrong metal in its welds. Um, so the, let's, my, I wrote a report for Mothers for Peace, which is why I'm uh, invited to speak today. Uh, it's 100 pages long, and I have like four minutes to give you the, uh, the cliff notes on that 100-page report. Um, point number one is embrittlement, which I talked about. When they welded this nuclear reactor together, they put the wrong metal in. And as the reactor runs, the neutrons inside hit the wrong metal and cause it to weaken and essentially disintegrate. If the vessel cools down too fast, it'll shatter like glass. If it heats up too fast, it'll shatter like glass. This is the only disaster that the NRC uh, evaluates that it requires that the operators have to work perfectly. It requires that operator action has to come at exactly the right time. If the operators push the button too soon or too late, they'll crack the nuclear vessel. That creates something called the class nine nuclear accident, which is beyond imaginable. The nuclear reactor fails, the containment blows up, and um, then you have to evacuate depending on the wind, um, San Francisco or LA. Uh, remember the, when Fukushima had its meltdown, which I wrote a book about, um, uh, the premier of, of uh, Japan, a friend of mine, Nero Khan, um, was faced with the possibility of evacuating Tokyo, which was 150 miles away. So um, an embrittled vessel at uh, Diablo puts the state in exactly that same situation. So my report had three pieces. Embrittlement, which um, uh, vessel cracks like glass, unless the operators work perfectly. The second thing was deferred maintenance. Um, in 2004, my report showed that Diablo asked for a 20 year extension before they did the inspection on this nuclear reactor vessel. So they knew in 2004 that they weren't going to run this plant beyond 2024 because the NRC gave them their exemption until 2025. So they've been deferring maintenance on this plant for two decades. My report talks about uh, deferred maintenance on the doors into the control room, which have to be hermetically sealed. They were falling off with rust. Uh, talks about a... Um, a fan on the outside of the building that was designed to evacuate air. It was so rusty from the salt air that it fell off. Um, other people have discussed the outdoor piping, which rusted. The list goes on and on. And deferred maintenance at Diablo is not something new. It's gone back at least a decade or two. Now, the... Um, um, okay. And of course, Linda Seely mentioned the proprietary issue where 
the the inspections they have done, uh, they're considering proprietary, which is an absolute an absolute joke. There's no such thing as a five year NRC license. They give twenty year licenses, and and Diablo can't afford to make the repairs that are needed because of all this work they pushed off in time. Diablo can't afford to make it and get a five year payback period. Now the concluding section of my interview with Ukrainian activist Denis Pilash. In this section, he talks about 2014 and the birth of the leftist formation called the social movement. You, you have millions of people with legitimate uh, grievances, with uh, driven by their uh, feeling of insecurity, by their feeling of um, enormous inequality uh, existing in the society, by their feeling of lack of political representation, by their feeling of um, being uh, suppressed by the, by the police state, um, and so on and so on. So uh, at a very basic level, uh, I think that uh, almost any protesters throughout the world uh, could understand this internal uh, grievance that was um, uh, moving the, uh, the the protest. Um, one of the big problems in, in the Ukrainian protest was that it um, never had uh, the opportunity to articulate these uh, grassroots uh, social demands, uh, these demands that were at their core uh, aimed against that oligarchy capitalist system that uh, reigns in Ukraine and not, not only in Ukraine. Uh, but instead, um, still the protests, they were, people were angry at the government, even those who had uh, previously supported Yanukovych. So at, at the moment of his uh, fleeing the country, his approval ratings were probably uh, somewhere below zero, uh, mm -hmm. because the, the same people who voted for him, they also felt that they are betrayed, even those who were uh, against the, the, this protest, but they, uh, they were uh, very disconnected with the level of uh, the corruption and the um, incompetence that was uh, manifested by, by him and uh, his closest set of oligarchs. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the problem was that, yes, you had this, this official agenda that was very liberal, very pro-European. You had, uh, like, agendas of some other um, political players, for instance, the uh, nationalist far right, that was actually against everything that was uh, promoted by the Maidan protests. So they were uh, obviously not for parliamentary democracy, not for uh, European integration and not for uh, some progressive values, but for m maybe the only thing that they, uh, they could use, it was this anti-Yanukovych and anti-Russian sentiment. But they uh, could uh, still push through their own agenda and their own imagery, their own slogans, their own flags. And uh, the big tragedy for, for, for us is that as the Ukrainian left at um, that point, um, it's not just exclusive to Ukraine. It's mostly in Eastern Europe, this dire situation. It was too weak. And uh, to present its uh, own political poll, to present its own, own political subject, to articulate this uh, anti-oligarchic, anti-capitalist uh, um, demands that, that were deeply inside many of the protesters. Though we, uh, our group at that point was called uh, the left opposition, and we uh, we distributed thousands of, uh, of leaflets circulating there with this uh, 12 points of, of or 10 points of, of social demands where we were uh, like uh, directly uh, stating that um, the problems for Ukraine, they will not wither, they will persist and we will have more and more such protests if we don't address the core of them, that is the uh, oligarchy capitalist system and that we need a democratic socialist alternative. Uh, but is still, this the start, uh, is this the start mm -hmm. of the official creation of social movement, or did that happen earlier? 
uh, uh, in in many cases, this is the start because mm-hmm. uh, so we we felt this uh, weakness of, of, of the democratic left of the uh, libertarian left of the revolutionary left uh, in, in Ukraine uh, and um, uh, this feeling was also shared by um, for instance um, those organized working class movements who also tried to um, articulate themselves during the, the protest for instance in the city of Kreverich, uh, that is uh, Roughly the center of Ukraine, a, a huge industrial city on ore mines and ore refineries, um, a very long city with uh, up, it's less than a million, but but uh, a big population. And by the way, it's the birthplace of the current uh, Ukrainian president. Uh, so there, the local Maidan protest was mostly uh, organized by the unions, by the independent unions, mm. independent unions of miners. Uh, but uh, these people and their leader, Yuri Samoylov, uh, was also uh, very clear that although this was a workers' protest with a, uh, another set of demands, with a more uh, progressive, more socially and uh, uh, pro-labor-oriented demands, but they weren't hear, heard by the official opposition. They weren't heard by these official agendas. And um, that the working class in Ukraine is, isn't represented in any position, neither in, in the government nor in, in, in the parliament, neither in the current, at that point, uh, a ruling uh, coalition or how to call it, uh, neither uh, nor in um, in the opposition, in the official opposition of liberals and nationalists and so on, and that we need a political subject that will be uh, left-wing and pro-working class. So these were the feelings that we, we had, uh, we shared both people who, um, like the young leftists in Kiev, many of, of whom like me, started in a militant uh, student union called Direct Action, and uh, these older um, work, workers, uh, trade unions, uh, activists who also had the same. So uh, we um, started building around this, our group at, this, at that point, left opposition, um, something that was first called Assembly for Social Revolution, and uh, again, it, it, it's uh, stated that albeit uh, the um, uh, Maidan or Euro Maidan uh, protests were um, in general uh, called um, a revolution, a revolution of dignity. That's the same name, I think it, it was in Tunisia. Um, but uh, it wasn't a revolution, a proper revolution, because it didn't change the system. And we need a social revolution that will change the social system. So this was the, the meaning of this um, of this name, uh, and ultimately um, this became um, our organization now called the Social Movement Social Network. Barbara Ehrenreich has died. She's famous for the superb book "Nickel and Dimed: How to Not Get By in America." She wrote it at the end of the Bill Clinton era, when government benefits were severely cut back under the slogan, get a job. She got lots of jobs, waitress, healthcare worker, house cleaner. And she showed in her book the low pay of these workers and how poorly they were treated. Barbara Ehrenreich, was interviewed a decade ago on Democracy Now! Well, it, I took on a, a, a challenge that I set myself, which was to see whether I could support myself on the money I could earn in, well, obviously, entry-level jobs, uh, which are the, you know, kind of jobs where you go and apply, and they're not going to add, you know, they're not going to ask for a resume, they're not gonna, they, don't, they don't care about anything except whether you're a convicted felon or whether you have—you're actually, you know, it's legal for you to work in this country. And all these jobs— 
averaged at the time in um, around 2000 uh, about uh, $7 an hour even including the tips with waitressing, uh, which at the, it would be equivalent to about $9 an hour now. And basically, what I found, that for me, just as one person, I wasn't trying to support my family with my earnings or anything like that, uh, it, it just wasn't doable, because the rents were so out of line uh, with, uh, with, my, with my earnings. And I, I did—, I did Try. I mean, I didn't spend anything money except on gas, food, and um, uh, you know the, the bare minimum, which was possible to do because I was in, I worked at each city for only a month, you know, so I wasn't depending on you know medical care or anything like that was not uh, coming through my jobs, but uh, I found. You know, a very important thing. Uh, well, two very important things. First, at seven dollars an hour or nine dollars an hour in today's dollars, you're not considered poor. You know, you don't show up in the poverty statistics. That you're considered to be fine if you're a one individual earning that much. And the other big lesson here is, uh, which is maybe a hard one to remember at a time of high unemployment, is that jobs are not necessarily a cure for poverty. Jobs that don't pay enough to live on do not cure poverty. They condemn you, in fact, to a life of low-wage uh, labor and, and, and extreme insecurity. If you're going to the Connecticut Folk Festival and Green Expo, Take a look for us. We'll be around the booth of Promoting Enduring Peace. Before we go, let me note events at the Palestine Museum in Woodbridge on Saturday, September 10th, an online and in-person event with Don Wagner about his new book. And on Sunday, two films about the Sabra Shatila massacres, Gaza Hospital and Massacre, starting at noon on Sunday. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.